So here we have younger, driest boundary spherules displaying some of the wide range of surface microstructures indicative of melting and rapid quenching. The top three are from the topper site out in South Carolina. Okay, so the topper site, right? So this is the younger, driest boundary. Um, the middle six are from Blackwater Draw, and Brad and I have visited Blackwater Draw. That's where um, near Clovis, New Mexico, which gave its name to the Clovis culture because the first um, studied Clovis site in North America was Blackwater Draw. And what was significant about the Blackwater Draw site was here was a mammoth skeleton found with a Clovis spear point embedded in the rib cage. So uh, yeah. that was, oh, so here's evidence that they did hunt them. Of course, the problem then was you find one mammoth with, with a spear point embedded in a rib cage. Overkill. Yeah, you extrapolate <laughs> from that. Well, if they hunted one mammoth here, then they must have killed the entire species over the entire planet. <laughs> right. I don't see necessarily that one follows from the other. Yeah, just because it, it's just what we do. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just what we do. Wanton slaughter. Right. That's our, that's Let's, our thing. Right. <laughs> so these six are all from Blackwater Draw. And notice the, the, the surface texture of these things. Again, what you're seeing here is a surface that melted and then crystallized. So this is what they're referring to as quenching. And so this is character. And, and the reason that they know that is because they've duplicated all of this in the laboratory by taking similar compositional uh, material and, you know, melting it under high temperature and high pressure and then studying the effects of it as it cools and forms essentially the, the same type of a, of a surface texture. And I'm sure I can find some examples of laboratory produced microspherals that, you know, have the same type of surface, what they would call a melting and quenching melt on the one hand, melt and quench. So quench is the, is essentially the, the, the cooling off of it. But several things. Look at look at the second one from the topper site here. It's see how it's broken. Again, yeah, it looks hollow too, like and it looks cool. hollow. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then the bottom, um, as it says, there is a uh, the Paw Paw Cove. It's an archaeological site on the coast of Talbot County, Maryland. The site first identified in 1979 is a complex of three locations on 500 meters of shoreline on Chesapeake Bay at which stone artifacts with an estimated date of 11,500 to 10,500 before common era have been found. Now, this is interesting. 11,500 before common era, you know, means that you're, you're counting before 2,000 years ago, right? So if you add that 2,000 years to the 11,500, you're right at 12,500. So what's happening here is they're finding stone artifacts showing up Roughly between three and four hundred years after the Younger Dryas, that would be thirteen five, right? Yes, this would be about. Um, oh yeah, 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 thirteen five. Oh, so then they're Clovis, yeah, they're Clovis, and then right. twelve. So yeah, right, right yeah. in there, right. Thirteen to twelve five, yeah, thirteen five to twelve five. Yeah. But these are estimated dates. So so yes. then yeah, excuse me, I retract that. I misspoke. Yeah, thirteen five would be um, that would actually be Clovis then, because yeah. remember the Clovis were pre Younger Dryas boundary, right? And then the bottom one, as it says, was is from this Paw Paw Cove, and here you get look at the middle one here. You've got a spheral, but it's been bombarded by all these much smaller spherules that again under high heat and pressure just hit the bigger spheral, and then they welded together. And that's what you're seeing here. So this was part of uh, LeCompte and, and, and company's independent evaluation of conflicting microspheral evidence. And here's a framboidal spheral, which is a very different animal altogether. At these three sites, framboids are morphologically different, but chemically indistinguishable from the apparently melted microspherals described in the foregoing. On the other hand, Israde or Israid at Al in 2012 reported the sulfur-rich framboids from Lake Cuzio, Mexico, are chemically different from the ones we observed. Now, see, the thing is that the framboids are presumed to be terrestrial in nature. And without these high, high-resolution microscopes, you aren't going to be able to tell the, 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 the morphological differences between those and 
a surface, for example, that we were just looking at where you see this melt quench uh, sequence there, see? So these things can actually have a, a, a pseudo uh, organic formation. And a lot of the, some of the critics were saying, well, you just saw these framboids and you, what you were reading, you were, weren't looking at something produced in an impact. You were just looking at these regular framboids that are found, you know, throughout soil and so on. And then, so what, what LeCompte and team are doing here is showing that no, no, what we're looking at is actually a very different animal. Yeah. That's, that's the scale of that thing is way, is a lot smaller, isn't it? What does that say? Five microns? This one is a 17, 17, 17, 17 okay. micrometers diameter framboidal yeah, sphere. Small. Yeah. I mean, some of the other ones were like a hundred yeah. uh, micrometers. And then there was even one that was like a, you know, on a centimeter scale. But, yeah. but notice that it's nonetheless, it's chemically uh, indistinguishable. So what right. that suggests is that these microspherals that we're looking at are composed. A lot of it is from crustal material that's been ejected into the atmosphere. Right. So, um, and different quenching processes probably, maybe? Probably, would, yeah. Re result in the crystal growth being more pronounced in those framboids than, than, than the smoother spheres? I don't know. So this is another excellent paper um, that we're looking at here. It's called uh, Evidence for Deposition of 10 Million Tons of impact spherules across four continents 12,800 years ago. They're commenting here and they say air bursts by a fragmented comet or asteroid have been proposed as the younger, at the Younger Dryas onset based on identification of an assemblage of impact related proxies, including microspherules, nanodiamonds, and iridium distributed across four continents at the Younger Dryas boundary. Spheral peaks have been independently confirmed in eight studies, but unconfirmed in two others, resulting in continued dispute about their occurrence, distribution, and origin. And of course, we've talked about those other two. But what happens is, as you get these multiple teams going out and looking, more and more people are actually and, and understanding better the protocols that you have to follow to find these things and where to look precisely. Once the, the, the improvement in technique has, has evolved, now you have teams that are going out and finding this stuff. To further address this dispute and better identify the YDB spherules, we present results from one of the largest spheral investigations ever undertaken regarding spheral geochemistry, morphology, origin, and processes of formation. We investigated 18 sites across North America, Europe, and the Middle East, performing nearly 700 analyses on spherules using energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy for geochemical analysis and scanning electron microscopy for surface microstructural characterization. We're using the term surface microstructural characterization this is what we were just looking at in looking at these, the surface textures of these things, which shows the melt quench process. 12 of the locations rank among the world's premier end Pleistocene archaeological sites, where the younger driest boundary marks a hiatus in human occupation or major changes in site use. Our results, now this is another new team, you know, following upon the work we were talking about last week. and. And tonight, our results are consistent with melting of sediments to temperatures greater than 2,200 degrees centigrade by the thermal radiation and air shocks produced by passage of an extraterrestrial object through the atmosphere. They are inconsistent with volcanic, cosmic, anthropogenic, lightning, or orthogenic sources. So when he says cosmic, that's referring to this, this, this slow, steady, gentle rain that we, of, of cosmic material that we were just talking about. We also produced spherules from wood in the laboratory at more than 1,730 degrees centigrade, indicating that impact-related incineration of biomass may have contributed to spheral production. 
at 12.8 thousand years ago, an estimated 10 million tons of spherules were distributed across 50 million square kilometers, similar to well-known impact strewn fields and consistent with a major cosmic impact event. So yeah, impact-related spherules have long been considered one of the most distinctive proxies in support of this hypothesis. However, despite increasing evidence for YDB peaks and impact spherules, their presence and origin remain disputed. In the latest example of this dispute, Boslo and others stated that, quotes, magnetic microspheral abundance results published by the impact pr proponents have not been reproducible by other workers. <laughs> However, the authors, being Boslo and others, neglected to cite nine independent spheral studies on two continents that reported finding significant YDB spheral abundances as summarized in high-profile previously published papers, mentioning papers we have now looked at by Israd et al., Bunch et al., and Lecomte et al., all of which we have now looked at. The nine additional sites are located in Arizona, Montana, New Mexico, Maryland, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, Mexico, and Venezuela. We've not talked about the Venezuelan uh, evidence yet, um, which is very important and quite interesting, actually, um, because with the discovery in Venezuela, the geographic range of this phenomenon got extended considerably, just as with the discovery of Younger Dryas boundary proxies in Syria, you see. And so part of the idea here is, well, we know now that it covers a large part, portion of the Earth's surface. What's the limit of it? We don't know. But what's happening is as the, the, the um, you know, studies move further and further out away from North America, and we keep finding this stuff, like, uh, let's see, right here, an interesting paper that I have been reading this last week. Um, yes. Okay, so this is the paper. Is it going to be backwards? Uh, no. No, we can see it. Okay, good. Did, Antarctic. Did the black mat impact airburst reach the Antarctic? Evidence right. from New Mountain near the Taylor Glacier in the Dry Valley Mountains. Their conclusion is, yes, it did reach the Antarctic. So there we go. I mean, it's like we're looking and we're finding that more and more that the extent of, the, of this phenomenon is just growing to encompass ever larger portions of the planet. 